welcome. And as you said, we are doing the letter to the church at Smyrna. This is chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And as we mentioned last week, this is one of only two churches that receive absolutely no negative comments from Jesus. Would that the Lord could say the same for all of our churches. And I'll just read uh, these four verses so that we again have it in our mind. And to the messenger of the church of Smyrna write, the first and the last who died and became alive says these things. I know how you are suffering and how poor you are, but you are rich. And how you are slandered by those who say that they are Jews and are not, but rather are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are going to suffer. You see, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison in order that you may be tested. And your suffering will go on for ten days. Continue to be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let the one who has an ear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who wins the victory will not be hurt at all by the second death. So again, a very uh, upbeat letter from the point of view of praise, even though they are clearly going to be facing persecutions. And let's just dive right in. Uh, First and the last, as we found in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 17, this is Jesus, the Lord of time. He was there before creation. He'll be there as this present creation is destroyed and the new creation and the new earth is established or brought into existence. Some have seen in this an allusion to the idea that all of these cities, Smyrna included, were very big on being first. First metropolis, first in Asia, first in emperor service, and all this kind of stuff. And this sort of civic pride certainly has not died out. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in California, I know, for example, that Gilmore, Gilmore California is the garlic capital of the world. San Diego calls itself the world's finest city. So this sort of pride still exists. Uh, have you been to Kennett Square, Pennsylvania? Oh, yeah. So you know where the mushroom capital of the world is. Not the United States, the world. So this sort of civic pride is still present. And it was very big. And, and some have seen this first and last as sort of a, a reference, saying something like, you can climb as, as high as you want in the community's eye, but you'll never really be first. Jesus is first. I personally think that this is kind of a lame comparison. Uh, it doesn't work when it appears in chapter 1. So you're investing it with a new meaning. But if you're reading commentaries, you might see it. Furthermore, here we got a church that is praised for all the way through. And when people bring this out, they bring it out in a way of warning. Jesus is warning them not to be fooled by all these other things that are enticing them away and saying, oh, we need to be first here or we need to be first there. And Jesus praises this church right down the line. It's not like Ephesus, which was praise, 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 but then it's, ah, but you lost your first agape. Uh, here, it's, it's all the way. So I just see that reference to the timelessness of Jesus. Then we come to the phrase, who died and became alive. Some see this phrase as ep exegetical. What that means is that who died and came alive explains first and last. Right. I've read their arguments, and again, that doesn't really sway me because clearly this is a reference to his death, which would include you know the whole whole nine yards there, the the trials and the crucifixion 
and dying and being buried and all that. And then it would be the resurrection. And that would include the whole nine yards also, resurrection appearing to everybody, ascending and so forth. And that doesn't really fit as nicely when it appears in first with first and last when it appears in chapter one. So I don't think this is F exegetical. I think that it is another title. Not explaining the first title, but he is Lord of Time. Mm -hmm. And you might say the reason he is Lord of Time is that he died and uh, is now alive. But that doesn't really work too well in my mind either because he was uh, Lord of Time before his death and resurrection. So I think instead those who see the reference to the impending persecution that they're facing are right mm -hmm. when they look at this. You are facing death. Jesus is not only Lord of time, but what else is he Lord of? Death and resurrection. So that when you face death, your Lord is one who has already faced it. Not only has he already faced it, but he has already conquered it. So no matter what happens, no matter where you go in time, Jesus is there. No matter what you face in life, Jesus has faced it. And in both cases, not only is he there, but he has conquered. So I think this is the kind of thought process that is coming along here. Now just as a uh, point of information, this translation here really is got it became alive. That's really uh, much better than the King James that says he is, you know, has died and is raised. Um, there is this uh, continuing kind of a feeling uh, he is the Lord of the living. And boy, the commentators just go on and on about that. Uh, so this is the one who addresses him. And of course, first and the last we first saw in chapter 1. So any questions about that? Okay. And of course, the messenger, again, we spoke about the Greek there is angelos, and many of the translations have angel. Uh, and so you can just review all the questions about whether or not we should say um, angel or messenger either is a legitimate thing uh, who died uh, that could also be translated who became a corpse oh. or a dead body uh, and that would be uh, perhaps a, a stronger contrast mm -hmm. um, I would I would also point out that here we have a clear reference to the two natures of Christ, because uh, if he's just God, he can't die. And we must remember that it is the true God who is the first and last. It is the true God who became a corpse and, be, and became alive. That is our Lord. And so we have that two natures in there for him. Okay. So if there are no questions about verse 8, then let's look at verse 9. Okay. I know how you are suffering. I know we get this omniscient feeling here. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens to us, to the church, that Jesus doesn't know about. So there's no accidents per se in spite of the fact that they are going to be suffering, and he says, I know how you are suffering. Uh, this is not happening unbeknownst to God. Okay? It's not happening unbeknownst to the first and the last, uh, the one who became a corpse and became alive. I know how you are suffering. Now, we're going to find out that the suffering is being uh, instigated largely by uh, the Jews in Smyrna, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But right now this suffering is a, a word that 
is, is like being crushed. It's great afflictions. We already did that small aside last week about persecutions and why Christians would be persecuted. And one of the things that will, he's talking about Jews in a little bit, that uh, we discussed about why Jews might be upset with Christians is that a lot of Jews were becoming Christians. And so the leadership would be concerned about this, shall we say. And to be honest, the Jewish population on the peninsula that is today uh, Turkey vanished. They all became Christians. So they, they had a real reason of concern. And the Jews that are there today are not descendant of the Jews that were there in the first few centuries. When the Roman Catholic church or leadership of Spain drove all of the Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula, something else they did was drive out the Jews. Now that doesn't get into the history books that much, but they wanted to make their country very Roman Catholic. That is why the um, in Inquisition starts there. And they were hunting down heretics. Now you got to realize here we're talking about the early 16th century. Who were the heretics? Lutherans. Oh. They were they, the, the Inquisition was a Lutheran hunt, and they were killing Lutherans. Now, if you go by the movies, they're only hunting witches. Witches were an itty bitty sliver. I mean, not too many people walked up and said, "I'm a witch. Go ahead and burn me." <laughs> yeah, that, that was not a smart thing to do. But what were the Lutherans doing? Of course I believe that I'm justified by grace alone, through faith alone. Ha ha, found that heretic. Kill the guy. Yep. And so uh, the Inquisition was mainly put in place to hunt Lutherans oh. and other Protestants. So the Jews had been kicked out. And where did they go? They went to the Ottoman Empire. Where was the Ottoman Empire? Where Turkey is and other, other places. But mainly they went to the uh, Anatolian Peninsula. Okay. So that the Jews that are there today are descended from that diaspora. Okay. Now in the Sephardic, the Sephardic Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. That's just, that's exactly right. You're dead on. So anyways, um, the... Jews probably had reason to be concerned from that point of view. They were losing members, mm -hmm. not just the, uh, the proselytes, the, the God-fearers, the Gentiles who were attracted to the higher moral, moral fiber of the Jews, but also genuine Jews. People who had been born Jews, had been raised Jews, had been studying the scriptures were becoming Christians. So there was a certain anxiety, a certain angst, and it would take three centuries, but eventually the Jewish synagogue disappeared until the 16th, 15th century, 14th century, right in there. So anyways, uh, the Christians here are suffering, they are in trouble, and uh, the word that's uh, translated suffering is defined from this letter, we can gain some idea of the unbound fortitude of these Christians. John assumes the people of Smyrna uh, share his own attitude to physical suffering. He speaks lightly of it as one speaks of familiar things. It's affliction. It's, it's uh, under pressure. And it will lead to mar martyrdom. This suffering has led to loss of property and how poor you are. There are two standard words for poor in the Greek. One is poor in the sense of a working class person. They have to live from paycheck to paycheck. They can't afford any of the luxuries in life. 
They don't have a big plasma screen TV. They don't have a big stereo system. They're driving a car that they got from Honest Joe's used car lot. Uh, they buy retreads for their car. They get by, but they are, for all intents and purposes, poor. They're the working poor, you might say. They work, they got, they got a job at McDonald's. They never graduated high school, maybe, or something. They're the working poor. And then there is another word for poor, and that's destitute. You can't even afford that secondhand car. You can't even afford that old black and white TV. Or you can't even afford a rotary phone, much less the latest iPhone and stuff like that. These are the, the destitute, and that's the word being used here. And this is one of the results of the persecution that they have undergone. Yes, uh, many of the early Christians were drawn from the poor sections of the culture. And so any number of them would have been poor whether they were in church or not. But a lot of them also would have come from the Jewish community. And they were, if not rich, at least comfortable. They were well off but they would have been cut off, ostracized. People would maybe stop attending their business because they had become Christians. Remember, Christianity was a despised superstition, and good people would not want to associate with them. And so to be, be known as a Christian would become a financial worry. You could lose your job. The second thing that might have happened, and again, we're going to have to talk about might ofs here, but this is a city that is known for its emperor worship. Yeah. Remember, the, the, okay, you remember, good. So uh, when these guys would not participate in the worship, that could have led to vandalism yeah. and persecution along that line, people stealing their property. Also, the government might have uh, confiscated their property and so forth. And then finally there was out and out persecution. And by out and out persecution, I, I mean exactly what it sounds like. People would be uh, losing their lives, not just their livelihood, but their lives. People would be martyred for the faith. So there are all sorts of reasons why uh, they were destitute. Now, it, John goes on to say, or Jesus goes on to say, but you are rich. Now, this is that sort of uh, dichotomy, if you will, contrast. But when he says you are rich, he doesn't mean go dig in your backyard like Jed Clampett and you're going to find <laughs> oil, okay? He doesn't mean you're going to take a little hike and you're going to find uh, a large gold nugget that nobody ever noticed before and become, and you're really rich. He's talking about spiritual wealth. He's talking about the sort of things uh, that all Christians really are rich in. We're rich in grace. Uh, we have peace pa that passes all understanding. We have a heavenly home that is beyond comparison. We have the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so forth. And you can think of any number of passages about this in the, um, in the Bible that accents the richness or the wealth that we have. It is something that the world will not understand or reckon as wealth. It's not a material wealth, but it is an eternal wealth. And how you are slandered by those who say that they are Jews. Now this slander is evil speaking, abusive speech. Uh, they And again, when we did that out handout about persecution, we talked about some of the slanders that were issued against mm -hmm. Christian, Christians, about the um, uh, accusations of orgies, right. accusations of cannibalism, right, right. 
and so forth and so on. So this is the slander that they are issuing against these. Another slander that we covered there would be that they are not good citizens. Ramsey has this kind of a, a strange idea that um, the Smyrnans were the only real, the Smyrnan Christians were the only ones who were true Smyrnans and all these others are fake Smyrnans. And he, he I, I think he's just trying to sidestep the Jews but aren't Jews. And so he says, Jews are, you know, but aren't Jews, that is those who are Jews only ethnically, but not spiritually. And so he has Smyrnans that are only Smyrnans ethically, but not spiritually. And if you brought that forward, then you have Americans that are yeah. Americans only yeah. ethnically, shall we say. Uh -huh. And then there's the Christians who are Americans spiritually, if you will. Uh, it, it, it becomes a very cumbersome kind of analogy. Um, so anyways, um, we're not going to go there. Instead, <laughs> uh, there's slander. Now here's where it's pointed out by those who say they are Jews. Uh, we should understand that these are ethnic Jews, but they have abandoned the faith of Abraham because the faith of Abraham is faith in Christ. We are not talking about secular Jews. These are observant Jews, but they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the person whom Abraham believed in. He did not know the name Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to get into that silly debate. You know, he, he believed in the promised one, the right. seed that was promised to Adam and Eve that's tracked all the way through the Old Testament genealogies. Did he know Jesus, the seed's mother was going to be named Mary? No. Did he know the seed's adoptive father would be Joseph? No, but that doesn't mean he didn't believe in him. Okay? So they have rejected the Lord of the Old Testament and have accepted an idol created out of tradition. This becomes a lesson for us to learn uh, in that we have to be cautious of tradition. And you know that I am a lover of tradition. I really am. I, if, if you look at the, our blog, you see I, I post about saint days mm -hmm. and all that kind of good stuff. But that is never elevated above scripture. It is never elevated above Jesus. Oh, you know. And if you see something that leads you away from Christ, it is not the true tradition. Okay? So uh, these are people who are ethnically Jews. They are ethnically observant. They are not secular Jews, but they have abandoned the faith of Abraham, which is faith in the promised seed. And that's why it says, and are not. They say they are Jews. God says they are not. Okay? But rather are the synagogue of Satan. Now, synagogue is a word which means assembly, much like the word that is often translated church, ecclesia, means assembly. But ecclesia is a Greek word, and synagogue comes from Hebrew. It is perhaps a reflection of an Old Testament way to refer to the people of God, as the assembly of God. That's often used in the Old Testament. And so maybe there's a contrast being put there. They are not an assembly of God. They are really an assembly of Satan. When they get together, they are not in the service of God, but in the service of Satan. Mm -hmm. And this comes out especially clear because they are persecuting the people of God. Now, I should point out <clears throat> that this is a constant problem in the contemporary American Christian 
seen. And that is because <clears throat> I don't, well, I don't know why this happens. I, I know the historic things that have led to this. Mm -hmm. But I really feel that there are nefarious spiritual forces behind this. This whole restoration of the of Israel as an indicator of the last times yeah. is bogus. Yeah. There is not a promise that the nation of Israel will come back. Yeah. Now I happen to support Israel, but I support it because it's a democracy. Uh -huh. And I think democracy, of all the lousy governments there are in this world, is still the best. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's about the size of it. <laughs> and democracies can be self-correcting. Uh -huh. So I, I'm pro-democracy. Uh -huh. Israel is a democracy. So I'm supportive. But I cringe whenever anybody says it's the fulfillment of prophecy. It is not. And it is not a friendly nation for Christians. It just isn't. They have laws against Christianity. Uh, they accept every type of Jew mm -hmm. and give them citizenship automatically except for a Jew who has become a Christian. Okay. If you are an Jew, ethnic Jew who has become a Christian, they will not grant you citizenship. Mm -hmm. they, yes, they won't grant you a citizenship mm -hmm. there. And uh, there are, that's just one example of the rules that that nation has against Christianity. They don't want to be too upfront about it because Christians provide a lot of support for them. But, you know, it's like send us your money, but not, not, your, not your believers. Don't come over here with us, though. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, you can come visit, see your right, holy right, sites, that's fine. You know, leave your money. It's, a, it's like when I lived in San Diego, I said I loved tourists because they came, mm -hmm. left, uh, mm -hmm. spent their money, and left. Right, right. Say, don't come and move here. Uh -huh. Visit, fine. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, you know, that's kind of their attitude. Christians, come, visit, leave your money, and go home. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Um, anyways. Um, so uh, they are identified clearly as the synagogue of Satan. Uh, so that kind of ties in with being blasphemers. The uh, Satan means uh, slanderer or accuser. Uh, accuser. It, it's sort of a um, a courtroom type word. Uh, do not be afraid of what you are going to suffer. Again, suffering, suffer, same sort of thing. Uh, a real accent that this is not going to be a fun time coming up. You see, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. And here we have uh, the word devil. Don't, um, and the word devil uh, is... Okay. It's in here somewhere. Um, but the word devil or diabolos is also being used as a proper name. And it's clearly here being used as a synonym for Satan, the same person in this particular case. Uh, and no, this is not diabolos. This is daimos, isn't it? Let, let, let Diamond. Let me check this out really quick. Uh, we are in verse 10. ten. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, no, it's Diabolos. Okay, oh. Diabolos. It is Diabolos, devil. Uh, uh, Diamond is a demon, and a demon seldom appears singular, right. it's usually a plural. Whereas Diabolos is singular, always seems to be a singular. So it seems to be referring to an individual. 
spiritual being. And the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. We should understand that prison was not the punishment. Prison is where you wait for trial. And Rome believed in speedy trials. There was none of this stuff where you're waiting for your trial for a year, two years, three years, like we have. I, I don't know how the courts have interpreted a speedy trial, but Rome would not have understood our concept of a speedy right. trial. A speedy trial meant, for the most part, boy, you know, boom, boom, boom. And if you wanted to accuse me of something, I got arrested. Uh, you didn't show up for court. There was none of this stay. While it was inconvenient, well, you know, you're not here. He's out of here. You know, case dismissed. You either got there or the case was dismissed. You know, and then uh, prison was not a punishment. It was just a holding place. The three standard forms of punishment were exile, fine, death. You don't, you don't get sentenced to five years in prison. You get exiled like John on Patmos. You get fined, which happened a lot to the wealthy Christians. Right, right. Or you get killed yeah. like what happened to Jesus. Uh -huh. So uh, this idea that, that some people being uh, anachronistic and forcing modern practices in their mind back mm -hmm. to their, th they think some of you guys are going to be thrown into prison and then, you know, things are going to uh, go one way or the other. No, they're going to get tried right. on the charge of being uh, either uh, unpatriotic and they could absolve themselves from that by offering their yeah. pinch of incense, mm -hmm. which they weren't going to do. Or they were uh, going to be tried on uh, being irreligious, and all they had to do was, uh, you know, being an atheist, and all they had to do was worship one of the local gods to disprove that, like the Caesar, and so forth. So uh, they were going to get convicted, is what it boiled down to. You got thrown in jail, you were going to get convicted. So this is the uh, problem they're going to have. In order that you may be tested. Again, notice, even during this terrible situation, it's not out of God's hands. God is in control. And this test is not just for them, that they may stand strong, but it's so that all the magistrates and all the people in Smyrna can see that the Christians stand strong. The idea that there would be something more precious than life was an utterly foreign concept to the ancient world. Indeed, for the most part, it is a foreign concept today. Listen to people who have no faith as they talk about suicide bombers. They can't even possibly get it. They have no idea how you can convince a person to do that. But if you truly believe that this is going to send you into uh, heaven, I mean, it, it's a done deal. All I have to do is strap some dynamite on me and walk into this building and I go to heaven. For the religious, that could be yeah. very intoxicating, very strengthening, okay? So the people in the ancient world, they had nothing to compare this mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're going to be tested and your suffering will go on for 10 days. Now remember, 10 is a reference to complete. Okay. So now this could possibly be referencing a real, literal 10 days. Okay? And I don't want to discount that. But it could also mean for a complete time. This will not be unending, okay. but it will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. Uh, some of you in a prison in order that you may be tested and that'll be a witness um, and your suffering will go on for 10 days. Continue to be faithful until death. Notice 
that this is not in any way a suggestion that some of them were unfaithful. Again, some commentators, desperate to find something wrong with this church, are going to say, see, some of them were falling away. And so he's encouraging. Yes, he is encouraging them, but what's he encouraging them to do? Continue to be faithful. If I was to encourage the two of you to continue to be faithful in your marriage vows, would you say that I'm implying that you had been unfaithful? No. Okay. He's not implying that they were unfaithful. Continue to be faithful until death. Clearly the implication here is that at least some of them are going to die, be martyred, pay the ultimate price uh, from a human point of view, and I will give you the crown of life. Crown there is Stephanos. It is the victor's crown. It is... uh, laurel leaves or oak leaves or something like that that the winner at the Olympic Games would get. Remember when we looked at the background for this city? This city had the most famous games outside of uh, Rome or, or Greece for their games. So they would be well aware of this. Stephanos, though, also is um, the the crown. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read you something here from William Barclay uh, from his Daily Study Bible. Okay, this is different uses for the word Stephanos, where we, by the way, get the name Steve or Stephen. In right. case you know anybody named that. First, to the mind comes the victor's crown in the games. Smyrna had games which were famous all over Asia. As in the Olympic Games, the rewards of the victorious athlete was the laurel crown. The Christian can win the crown of victory in the contest of life. B, when a man had faithfully performed the work of a magistrate, at the end of his term of office, he was granted a crown. He who throughout life faithfully serves Christ and his fellow men will receive this crown. I should point out that this was especially true in Smyrna. They have coins where their magistrates have this crown they got for faithful public service. C. The heathen world was in the habit of wearing crowns, chaplets, or flowers at banquets. At the end of the day, if the Christian is loyal, he will have the joy of sitting as the get as a guest in the banquet of God. Okay. Uh, D. The heathen worshippers were in the habit of wearing crowns when they approached the temples of their gods. At the end of the day, if he had been faithful, the Christian would have the joy of entering into the nearer presence of God. That's another possible meaning. E. Some scholars have seen in this crown a reference to the halo or nimbus which is around the head of divine beings in pictures. If that is so, it means that the Christian, if he is faithful, will be crowned with the life which belongs to God himself. As John said, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. And that (coughs) idea is particularly lame because that had not entered into Christian art yet. So the chances of that being the references is, is really stem. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, so uh, another um, reference to Smyrna, the city. Some have said this would be particularly meaningful to the people at Smyrna because how the poets had described the city sort of as a goddess with its feet in the water at the, at the bay and the head crowned uh, with a crown, which was that hill with with all of the temples and municipal buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, (laughs) maybe, but it's not going to be the primary image that we're we're trying to get across here. Primary uh, image for this crown should be found, I think, with the word life. There, the word life, because that's the type of crown it is, right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
And so the, the word there for life is not bios, which would be physical life, but zoe, which most often refers to spiritual life, eternal life. So this is the crown of eternal life. So remember Jesus who was dead and is now living. He says, though you die, yet you shall you live. It reminds me of an old saying I once heard went something like this. Uh, die, no, be born once, die twice. Mm. Be born twice, die once. Mm. Okay? okay? And so he goes on, okay. will not be hurt at all by the second death. The second death is hell. Yeah. There's no doubt about it because second death comes in again later on. Uh, and um, at the end of the okay I'm, and I'm looking here really quick to find it and I'm not seeing it but uh, well we're in verse 11 okay well that, that's worth knowing okay uh, in uh, Revelation 20, verse 14. Mm -hmm. uh, just look that up really quick. Revelation 20, verse 14. Twenty, verse 14, and it reads, And death and Hades were thrown into the fiery lake. The fiery lake is the second death. Okay, so here we see the second death more explained, mm -hmm. and it's hell, it's damnation, it's eternal damnation. And we will explain that passage a little bit better when we get there. We'll also see it again in Revelation 21, verse 8. But bottom line, uh, the one who wins the victory... Uh, is the one who gets this uh, crown of life. Where was I with that crown of life? Oh, there we are, verse 10. Okay. And so that, that's eternal life that we should be thinking of. And so uh, because we have that word victory tied in there, I think that the games idea is probably the best metaphor, not so much the party idea where we're wearing party hats or something like that. Now, the other common word for crown, and we will find it later, is diadem. A diadem is not a big crown like you think in medieval crowns, or you'll see in a lot of Christian art. A diadem is a really thin uh, band that goes around the head. If you have a turban, it would go around the turban. Uh, it is a word that comes out of comes to us out of the east and you would wear a different diadem for every area that you ruled so if you were an emperor you would an emperor must by definition have several kingdoms under their control and you would have uh, several bands or these these uh, thin ribbons even going around your head and oftentimes they had them as different colors representing the okay. different kingdoms that they ruled. But that's not the word here, uh, but we will get that later. Diadem is always a ruling crown. Okay. And the Stephan Stephanos would bear one of these other meetings. And as I said here, I see Victor. You've competed. You've crossed the finish line in death. And now you inherit that crown of life that victory crown of life. Let the one who has an ear, listen up, everybody. <laughs> listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, uh, we have this formula at the end of each of the letters. There's an accent on the unity of the Godhead here. This isn't just Jesus talking. Even though it's a, it's a vision from Jesus. We already saw that, right? This is Jesus' revelation. Nonetheless, listen to what the Spirit is saying. Because just as Jesus said nothing apart from the Father, okay, 
So also nothing apart from the Spirit. And it's the Spirit of God, it's the Spirit of Christ, and it's the Holy Spirit, three in one. One of the great mysteries of the faith, uh, and we get a little peek of it in terms of how it works here. The one who wins the victory, we already talked about that, which is why I think Stephanos is referring more to victory. By the way, of course, we get uh, the English name Victor from this, or Victoria. They're just victors. You know, mom and dad looked at Junior and said, or Missy and said, this is a winner. <laughs> okay. Uh, will not be hurt at all by the second death, and we already talked about that. Not hurt at all. You know, just again... All that suffering, all of those problems that they had faced in this life, a thing of the past. Now we have uh, joy everlasting. It is a little bit reminiscent of this past Sunday's gospel lesson where the poor man, Lazarus, goes to Abraham's bosom while the rich man is in misery. And we have finished. There we, go. we moved right along and we got a whole church done. So uh, next time we will look at Pergamum and we will start again with a review of background information. Very interesting city. A lot of interesting background stuff. Any questions about Smyrna? No, sir. There's a lot that I didn't know. Okay. Well, then, we will uh, conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.